In this tutorial screencast, we'll look at infrared spectroscopy, which is the experimental determination of functional groups. So our lecture synopsis is that um, the instrumental method of IR uh, spectroscopy is used to determine what functional groups are present in a molecule. Spectroscopy is the study of the interaction of light with matter. There are different types of light beyond just the visible light, which we perceive color. This is due to the electromagnetic spectrum that contains light from radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, x-rays, and gamma rays. Each of these types of light or radiation has both an energy and wavelength associated uh, with it, governed by the equations E equals mc squared or E equals h nu. Each type of light interacts with matter differently as well. For example, in IR spectroscopy, or IR as we've referred to it, uh, this light perturbs the, double bond, uh, per perturbs the bond dipole moment, uh, resulting in assorted bond vibrations. It is these vibrations we observe as signals in the IR spectrum. <clears throat> the IR spectrum is composed of two axes. The x-axis is the energy axis, defined as wave numbers, and the y-axis is absorbance defined as percent transmittance. The regions of the x-axis correspond to the different types of bonds being perturbed by different wavelengths of IR radiation. In terms of interpreting IR data, there is a signal in a specific region of the spectrum, then we can be reasonably sure that that uh, functional group is present in the molecule. Uh, alternatively, if there is an absence of a signal, we can be sure that that functional group is not present. The key concepts in lecture learning outcomes. So upon completion of this screencast, you should be able to describe the relationship between energy and wavelength on the electromagnetic spectrum, recite the different regions of radiation of the electromagnetic spectrum, sketch the nature of a chemical bond between two atoms, identify and name the key features of an IR spectrum including wave numbers, percent transmittance, region 1, region 2, region 3, and the fingerprint region, compare and contrast different modes of bond stretching that can occur, differentiate the functional groups that occur in the three main regions of an IR spectrum, and interpret an IR spectrum and use chemical intuition to determine if a molecule has any degrees of unsaturation. So in this next slide, we're going to look at um, basically the relationship of E equals mc squared. So again, spectroscopy is the interaction of light, which is electromagnetic radiation with matter. So we, we see the electromagnetic spectrum here. So on, on this end of the spectrum, we have really long wavelength uh, uh, light so these are radio waves. And as we, we go from right to left, we go from radio waves to microwaves to IR to visible, which is what we see, we perceive as color, to UV, X-ray, and cosmic rays. So as we, as we proceed from right to left, you'll notice the wavelength, which is defined as the crest to another crest or trough to trough, that progressively gets shorter and shorter. So as the wavelength decreases, the, the associated energy increases. So radio waves are relatively innocuous. Uh, we, li we listen to music over the radio. Um, there's, there's really no biological harm done from that. Um, so x-rays, on the other hand, are, are really shorter uh, wavelength radiation of, of high energy. And so uh, X-rays and cosmic and gamma rays can actually do harm to uh, cells. So uh, we, we know that, that UV light as well is, is bad for, for skin. Uh, it can cause cancer. But visible light uh, is, is probably the region where we're, we're, we're obviously safe. So we're familiar with uh, the colors of the rainbow, uh, Roy G. Biv, so red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, Roy G. Biv. Um, so 
that that's what we perceive as color. So in in infrared, so that's infra before red, uh, this region of the electromagnetic spectrum has wavelengths and sufficient energy to cause bond vibrations. So really what we're, we're considering is um, how that um, energy of light interacts with a bond dipole. And as we learned, um, bond dipoles arise from differences in electronegativity as defined by the periodic trend. So when you, when you have a greater difference in electronegativity, the bond dipole is larger. And typically, uh, for functional groups with larger bond dipoles, you'll see more intense signals in the IR. So let's just review what, what is a bond. So um, a bond occurs when two atoms uh, basically uh, share uh, electrons between them. So we define a bond as, as basically two electrons. So let, let's consider um, this graph here. On the x-axis we have internuclear distance and angstroms. And then the y-axis is the bond energy. So if, if we're really far to the right and we're considering two hydrogen atoms that exist but they're unaware of each other. So we're, we're sort of sitting on this part of the curve and as we move left, the distance between those two atoms is decreasing. So as we move left, the distance gets shorter, shorter, until finally they form a bond. So the unpaired electrons pair. We have a bond denoted by this line. And so they form a bond with one another and the average bond distance is we can think of as sort of the bottom of this Cur this curve or well. And so if we go up from the x-axis over to the y-axis, that gets us our average bond energy. And if, if these two atoms were to, to keep getting closer and closer to one another, that leads to repulsion. And the energy actually goes up because at that point we have nuclear uh, repulsion. So basically what happens is that a, a bond really isn't a static um, distance or, or energy so much. It's that um, these, these atoms in the bond themselves are always moving sort of in this well back and forth. We report a static bond distance um, just for, for ease of knowing that information. But the bond itself is, is moving back and forth. So it, it's getting shorter, it's getting longer, shorter, longer. So in that essence, it's like a spring. And so um, the, the spring can stretch, and that's what actually uh, the IR light is doing. It's, it's stretching and contracting that bond. So if we consider bonds or, or springs, uh, and basically springs have vibrations. And so we remember that electronegativity was used to assign the bond dipole moment. The magnitude of the bond dipole directly influence the intensity of the IR vibrational mode. And so we are looking at um, uh, basically six uh, common vibrational modes here. Um, so starting at the top here we have symmetric stretching. So if you consider these two blue atoms bonded to the central uh, yellow atom, so if this was a carbon and these were hydrogens, they are symmetrically stretching away from the carbon and being contracted at the same time. So that's symmetric stretching. Asymmetric stretching, we have one moving away, one moving closer. Wagging is, is both of them are moving um, sort of towards you and away from you at the same time. Twisting is the opposite sense, one's moving towards you, one moving away from you. Scissoring, uh, they're moving um, towards towards one another and away from one another in a scissoring motion, and then rocking, uh, they're they're moving both in the the same direction, uh, in the same plane. So we have stretching, symmetric stretching, asymmetric stretching, wagging, twisting, scissoring, and rocking. So those are the the common vibrational modes that we'll consider in an IR spectrum. 
So the relationship between bond energy and stretching frequency. So in our first column here, we have different types of bonds. The second column is the associated bond energy in kilojoules per mole. The third column is the stretching frequency. And the fourth column is the region, which we'll show on the next slide. So region one, two, three, or the fingerprint region. So for all intent and purposes, we're really, um, really only want to consider regions one, two, and three. The fingerprint region gets pretty hard to interpret. So it's what we'll consider a basic algorithm for looking at IR spectra to see if a functional group is, is present or not. Specifically, what, what is really useful is uh, the presence of double bonds. So for example, the carbonyl group, a lot of the functional groups we saw have CO pi bond. That has a bond energy of 745 kilojoules per mole and the stretching frequency of 1700. So these tend to be particularly uh, intense and very informative whether that group is there or not. CH stretching is not terribly informative because all molecules have CH stretching, so we don't really get a lot of information from, from that. So uh, alkynes, CC triple bond, has an energy of 840 kilojoules per mole and a, a stretching frequency around 2200 in region two. So that's also useful in determining whether uh, an alkyne is present. So the, th the main regions of the IR spectrum, we have region one consisting of XH stretching. So this is CH, um, OH, NH stretching occurs in this region, which is typically from about, say, 3,800 down to about 2,800. Region two is the triple bond region, so alkyne, nitrile or cyano, and azide. So that, that's from about 2100 to about 2500. Region three is the double bond region. So we have carbonyl, CN bond, that's called an imine, and CC pi, uh, pi bond, that's called an alkene. So this is about, say, 1500 to about 1800. And then this fingerprint region is region four. Anything below that, uh, we typically ignore because the spectrum gets really complicated. So IR spectra are good for determining what functional groups are present or absent. So if, if you see a signal in a specific region, then you can make um, a conclusion that a, a functional group is there. If there's the absence of that, you can make the conclusion that that functional group is likely not in the molecule. Since all molecules have CH stretching, so all molecules really have CH stretching. So it's really informative to look to region three first because that will tell you if there's basically a carbonyl or a, an imine, a CN pi bond or a CC pi bond. Um, if we consider electronegativity differences, um, the, the carbonyl CO pi bond will have the greatest dipole moment. So these tend to give the most intense stretches in that region. These are a little bit weaker and then these are even more so weaker. So really, we're really only considering the, the carbonyl stretch. Then you can look to region two for sharp absorptions belonging to a triple bond. So really, um, for the most part, you look to region three, to region two, then to region one. So over the next couple slides, uh, we're going to look at the different functional groups um, and, and look at what major diagnostic IR signatures um, are present. So the first slide, we have the alkane functional group. So the alkane condensed conform formula is typically R. R is anything carbon H. There are no degrees of unsaturation, and we've been using the fully saturated CnH2n plus 2. Uh, to determine degrees of unsaturation. So um, alkanes have your standard sp3 hybridized carbon H stretching in, in the range of 3,000 to about 2,800 reciprocal centimeters, so that's R. 
x-axis. So as we're reading this, um, we're at here about 90% transmittance. That means all the light is going through the sample. Then we're actually seeing some signal. So at this energy, basically we're seeing this functional group present. So pretty much every molecule is going to have uh, these sort of peaks. And so what, what do those actually belong to? If we watch this little movie, <coughs> you can see that when, when we hit that specific energy, we can see those different um, vibrational modes occurring. So when you actually see a, a peak in the spectrum, it's, it's a bond being perturbed um, by the IR light. So here's a couple different vibrational modes for an alkane. So that, that's what the, the peak, that's the phenomenon that's actually happening. So here's alkane nomenclature, which we'll go through quite a bit. Um, but the example that we've shown here is octane. So moving on to our next functional group, monosubstituted alkenes. So uh, monosubstituted alkene basically has a carbon-carbon pi bond with, with one carbon substituent. There's one degree of unsaturation corresponding to the pi bond. And these um, will now have um, an sp2 hybridized carbon H stretch that's greater than 3,000. The intensity is typically weak, and what that means is um, the, the percent transmittance um, doesn't really dip below 50, but the peak shape is very sharp, and we can see that in region 1. We have a peak greater than 3,000, so highlighted in this purple color. That belongs to uh, sp2 hybridized carbon H stretching. And region 2 we have nothing, region 3 we can see some, some CC pi bond stretching, but again, it has a weak. So what I mean by weak is the, the, the peak doesn't really go down past 50 in terms of percent transmittance, but it's, it's sharp. So this example here in the movie is one hexene. So we can see at about 3100, that's the sp2 hybridized carbon H stretching. So still above 3,000, we have some different vibrational modes of the, the alkene H stretching here. And then as we move into the 3,000 region, you see your typical sp3 hybridized carbon H stretching through the different uh, vibrational modes. Again, those would be symmetric uh, and, and asymmetric. So at about 1650, uh, 1675 here, you can actually see the carbon-carbon double bond uh, being stretched. So that's, again, in that region. And it's, it's not as intense due to the fact that the difference in electronegativity between the two carbons is not that great. So the next functional group is a cis-alkene. And so that's a pi bond where you have um, basically a carbon substituent bonded to one of the sp2 hybridized carbons and another one bonded to the other sp2 hybridized carbon, so R1 and R2. And those groups are on the same side of the alkene. So that's a cis-alkene. It has one degree of unsaturation. Uh, and so the unsaturated formula is CnH2n. So we remove those two hydrogens. That gets us one degree of unsaturation. So as we can see, uh, we'll, we'll play the movie. You can see the sp2 hybridized carbon H stretching greater than 3,000. And you can uh, see the normal sp3 CH stretching. And so around um, between 15 to 1700, that's when you see the carbon-carbon um, pi bond stretching as well. So you can see uh, in the static spectrum here that that is a, a weak intensity um, stretch, but it is sharp. It, it goes down, comes right back up. So it's a sharp but weak uh, intensity. 
So this example was cis-2-butene, and you can see what the, um, the cis means is that those carbon substituents are on the same side of the double bond. The 2 indicates the start of the alkene, so we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 carbons. Again, the substituents are on the same face, that's cis. The alkene starts at position 2, and we have 5 total carbons. So we have the next functional group is a trans alkene, where the R1 and R2 groups are now on opposite sides. So if we look, this example is trans 2 hexene. So here's our movie. We can see that the R group here, this methyl, and the rest of this chain are on opposite sides of this alkene. So again, greater than 3000, we see the C sp2 hybridized H stretching. Less than 3,000 is your normal uh, sp3 hybridized carbon stretching. Um, so again, depending on the intensity of um, the, the, the dipole moment between the carbon-carbon double bond, you, you may see it, a, a fairly intense um, signal for that. But normally uh, for alkene, pi bonds, the, the signal is fairly weak. And again, that's in region 3. So our next functional group that we're going to look at is the terminal alkyne functional group, which has the condensed formula of R, C, triple bond, CH. So that's what it means to be a terminal alkyne, is you have this sp hybridized carbon H bond. As we can see from the triple bond, there are two degrees of unsaturation. And alkynes typically have the general formula of CnH2n minus 2. So the major diagnostic IR signatures as seen for one hexine are in region 1, we have the C sp hybridized carbon H bond between 32 and 3100 with a strong, sharp uh, signal, and you see that uh, band highlighted here. Region two, uh, for terminal alkynes, you will see the triple bond between 24 and 2200, and that is usually a weak but a sharp looking peak, and you can see that in the red band. So if we look at the movie uh, of one hexine here, we see the sp hybridized carbon H bond stretching. Again, above 3000, about 3200. We see the normal sp3 hybridized carbon H stretching, and then you see the, the alkyne triple bond stretching uh, in region 2. So our next functional group is the internal alkyne. So what does it mean to be an internal alkyne? The condensed formula, you have a carbon group bonded to um, one carbon of the triple bond, and then another carbon group bonded to the other carbon. So the, the triple bond is embedded in the carbon chain. And again, we have two degrees of unsaturation. So the, the major diagnostic IR signatures um, for an internal alkyne, um, there really are no diagnostic signatures um, because you don't have that, that that CH stretching of the alkyne anymore because it's internal. So you really just see the normal sp3 hybridized carbon H stretching. So as you can see in the movie, um, you, you just see the normal looking stuff. You don't really see the carbon-carbon triple bond stretch um, because there's really not that great a difference in, in the dipole moment of that bond. So again, this was an example with two hexine. So our next functional group is a primary amine. So a primary amine has a condensed formula of some carbon group bonded to NH2. So that's what it means to be primary, is that the nitrogen is only bonded to one carbon and there's zero degrees of unsaturation. The major diagnostic signatures 
that we can see are in region one. So we have um, the NH2 stretching between 38 and 3000, which is strong. So it's, it's usually um, broad as well due to hydrogen bonding. And you can see that in this region one band. And if we play the, the movie here for this compound, one butanamine, we can see the NH stretching. So that's, that's what we're seeing here when we see the normal sp3 hybridized carbon H stretching, which is present in all molecules. So again, that's, it's not terribly diagnostic, but if your molecular formula has nitrogen with no degrees of unsaturation, and then some, a, a broad signal from 38 to 3000, it's, it's a good, good, good bet there's an amine in the compound. So our next functional group is the alcohol functional group and the condensed formula is ROH. So the OH signifies alcohol, it's a hydroxyl group. There are no degrees of unsaturation in, in the alcohol. And the major IR signatures in region one is the OH stretch. So notice how it looks different from the, what we just saw with the amine. Alcohols typically have this nice smooth um, peak from 3000 to 3100, it's strong, it's very, broad and, and baseline separated between the OH and the typical uh, sp3 hybridized carbon H stretching. So there's no diagnostic peaks in region two or three. So in our movie here for one propanol, we see the OH stretching, which corresponds to that nice broad signal. Then again, uh, around 3,000 is your, your typical sp3 hybridized carbon H stretching that every molecule has. So what's diagnostic is the OH stretch that really has that, that unique signature about it. So moving up an oxidation state to an aldehyde functional group, the aldehyde has the condensed formula R CHO, so the CHO means aldehyde, and that has the carbonyl CO pi bond, so that's one degree of unsaturation. The major diagnostic signatures are, there are two of them. So in region one, you have the sp2 hybridized carbon H stretch that belongs to the aldehyde, and that's below uh, 2800, so usually 28 to 2700. It's a weak intensity, but it's sharp. So weak is usually, um, you know, something between 150% transmittance. Uh, so you can see in this region one highlighted in purple here, that's the aldehydic proton stretch. Region two, there's nothing because there's no triple bond. And then region three is the actual carbonyl between 1800 1700, this is a strong signal. So again, the transmittance is, is basically approaching zero and it's a sharp peak. So this is what we mean by sharp. So let's look at the movie for this, this compound. This is one butanal. Again, we're seeing the normal, normal sp3 hybridized carbon stretching at this point. Now we're seeing the, the really intense um, aldehydic proton stretch. So again, that's between 28, 2700. So that coupled with the carbonyl stretch uh, is, is a good indication that you have an aldehyde in the molecule. So our next functional group we're gonna look at is a ketone. So a ketone has a carbonyl group. So our condensed formula would be something like R1COR2. So embedded in that carbonyl group is one degree of unsaturation. The major diagnostic signatures, region one and region two, there are none. Region three is the carbonyl. So as we can see for acetone, we have a nice strong carbonyl uh, at, at between 18 and 1700. So again, it's a strong signal the transmittance is approaching zero and it's sharp. So here is the movie for that. Again, here's your normal, normal 
SP3 hybridized carbon H stretching. It's not very diagnostic. So then for this molecule 2-propanone, we then get to the ketone. You can see the carbonyl stretch. So again, there's a lot of functional groups with, with CO pi bonds, the carbonyl group, and you differentiate them according to these subtle variations. Again, the aldehyde has that aldehydic CH stretch, whereas the ketone does not. So moving up in oxidation state now, we're at an oxidation state of three for carboxylic acid. This is the condensed formula for carboxylic acid, RCO2H. So we have a carbonyl that is directly bonded to an alcohol. So that's the acid group. It has one degree of unsaturation. The major diagnostic IR signatures are the OH stretching. So this looks a little bit different than we saw with an alcohol. Region two, there are none. Region three is a carbonyl. So the carbonyl coupled with the OH, a molecular formula with two oxygens and one degree of unsaturation uh, is indicative of an acid. So the molecule here is, is propanoic acid. So we have the OH stretch Our normal CSP3 hybridized carbon H stretching. And now we're seeing it at this, the, the carbonyl stretch of the acid. So again, to recap, the carbonyls all occur in region three, but you can usually differentiate them from other functional groups based on elements present in the molecular formula and degrees of unsaturation. So now we move to the ester functional group. So basically it's, it's similar to the acid, except we're replacing the hydrogen for another carbon group. So R1CO2R2. So the carbonyl has one degree of unsaturation, Notice now region one, region two, there's nothing diagnostic. We have the carbonyl that's usually a little bit higher than the other ones that we've seen. So usually around 1750 for an ester, again, strong and sharp. So let's look at the movie. So your normal CSP3 hybridized carbon H stretching, not very diagnostic. Then we get to the ester carbonyl stretch. So again, 1750 or above, that's usually diagnostic. So again, if you see an IR with a carbonyl and you're not sure whether it's uh, an ester or a ketone, remember that an ester will have two oxygens in the molecular formula. So we're still in oxidation state three functional groups and our next one here is the anhydride functional group. So now this one has three oxygens in it. So it has two degrees of unsaturation because there's two carbonyls present. And so region one and region two are not very diagnostic, but region three is because we can see now that because there's two carbonyls as shown in the, in the molecule here, propanoic anhydride, we can see that there's one carbonyl stretch and there's another. And then the actual movie, what we'll see is that the reason there's two is that there's symmetric carbonyl stretching and asymmetric carbonyl stretching. So that's, that's symmetric carbonyl stretching that we're observing. And the other one is asymmetric, where they're, they're sort of moving in, in different directions. So you know an anhydride is present in, in a molecule if you have three oxygens, two degrees of unsaturation, and then this doublet looking signature in region three. So again, oxidation state three functional group is the acid halide. So it has a carbonyl and then that 
sp2 hybridized carbon is bonded to a halide, which I'm calling X. So there's one degree of unsaturation. Region one, region two have no diagnostic signatures. And now region three, the carbonyl embedded in that acid anhydride is pretty much always at 1800 and it's, it's strong and sharp. So for this molecule shown in the movie, ethanoyl chloride, the, the carbonyl stretch is usually 1800. So again, we're at oxidation state three. And now we're looking at the primary amide functional group. So a primary amide has R, a carbonyl, and then it's bonded to NH2. The carbonyl is one degree of unsaturation. Region one has the NH2 stretching from 3,800 to 3,000. It's strong, and it's usually a sharp looking doublet. So you see this, this sort of broadness, and then you see a, a doubling of that peak. So compare that to what an alcohol looks like. Compare that to what a carboxylic acid looks like. And that peak shape looks different. Region two, we see nothing. There's no triple bonds. Region three, for amides in general, is usually less than 1700, and it's a strong, sharp peak. So in, in our movie here, we can see our NH2. We have asymmetric stretching showing. Now we have symmetric stretching. There's our, our normal sp3 hybridized carbon H stretching. And now we have our, our amide stretching, our CO carbonyl. So in, in this spectrum here, even though this number is higher than 17, this is a calculated spectrum. So this is, this is done through computation. Amides are typically below 1700 because the CO pi bond in the amide has less double bond character due to resonance. Now we move on to a secondary amide where we've replaced one of the hydrogens with another carbon group. So we're removing um, the, the hydrogen. We still have one degree of unsaturation. So our region one will have the NH stretching. Notice it does not have that doublet looking structure to it anymore. Um, these bands are usually strong and, and sharp. Region two has nothing. Region three, again, the carbonyl is usually below 1700. So there you see the NH stretch. And now there's the carbonyl stretch we see in region three. So again, that's what happening when, when as the laser is scanning across this region of the spectrum, as it hits the bond, the, the bond dipole, it, the bond dipole is excited and that stretching occurs. And so the, the transmittance decreases. And so that's how you see the signal. So our next is the tertiary amide group. So the nitrogen has been replaced. Uh, the hydrogens have been replaced on the nitrogen by two carbon, two, two different carbon groups. So we still have one degree of unsaturation. Region one and two, there's nothing diagnostic. Region three is our amide. So we have our typical sp3 hybridized carbon H stretching. And then now we have our, our carbonyl stretching for the amide. So our next functional group is the nitrile functional group. Again, oxidation state three, R, C, triple bond, N. Since there's two triple bonds, there's two degrees of unsaturation. So region one has uh, no diagnostic peaks. Region two has the triple bond. 
So we see that usually between 23 and 2200, as shown here in red, that's a strong, sharp peak. Region three, again, there's no double bonds. So uh, we're, we're looking primarily in region two. So as you can see in the movie, the, um, the CN triple bond is, is pretty sharp, intense um, stretch. So if your molecular formula has one nitrogen, two degrees of unsaturation, and a peak between 23 and 2200, you can assume that there's a nitrile present.